Colorado Cattlemen's Ag Water Network. And today's webinar focuses on a multi-year effort to better understand and quantify the consumptive uses related to improvement needs in the Middle Colorado watershed. Our speakers today are Wendy Ryan and Sarah Dunn, and they will be overviewing a two-year project which is focused on inventorying and assessing irrigation ditches and diversion structures in the Middle Colorado watershed, which is an area that roughly stretches from dot zero the top of the Glenwood Canyon to Debec, which is above Grand Junction. The project is administered by the Book Cliff South Side and Mount Sopris Conservation Districts. This is the 11th webinar hosted by the Ag Water Network, and these webinars are designed to help keep ag producers and other water stakeholders informed about watershed and stream management planning, as well as ag water leasing, water rights, and water quality. A little background on the Ag Water Network. The Ag Water Network was created by Colorado Cattlemen's and the Partners for Western Conservation about five years ago now out of concern over the increasing loss of irrigated ag land. So our mission is pretty simple. It's about helping to keep ag water connected with ag land. And we work to accomplish that through outreach, uh, meetings, workshops, presentations, webinars like today's, as well as collaboration with other groups such as conservation districts and the Colorado Ag Water Alliance and others. Technical resources and tools like our lease screening tool, which is an online resource that allows ag water right holders to assess the suitability of their water right for leasing. And all of our, our, all of our resources can be accessed at our website, agwaternetwork.org. If you have any technical questions today, if you have any issues with the display or sound, you can email your question or your issue to Aaron at coloradocattle.org. That's E-R-I-N at coloradocattle.org. Or you can call the office at 303-431-6422. Erin, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yes. Um, during the entire presentation, if you um, have a question, if you just want to put it in the chat function and send it to me or to all um all the panelists, and then we will address your questions after the presentation is over. Okay. And I believe that, and I'm, I'm going to put a little statement in there so you can see where the chat function is. It's just at the bottom of your screen, and that is it. Okay, thanks. By the way, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our website agwaternetwork.org next week, along with the highlights of the webinar, which is a summary of the main points that our speakers make. So if you don't have time to view the webinar, um, the highlights are a great way to get a sense for what was covered. So our speakers today are Wendy Ryan and Sarah Dunn. Wendy serves as the project lead for the Ditch and Diversion Structure Inventory and Assessment Project. She is a water resources consultant for Colorado River Engineering based in Glenwood Springs and former assistant state climatologist. Sarah is an attorney and partner at Balcom and Green Law Firm in Glenwood Springs. She has extensive water law experience working with clients on leasing and buying and selling of water rights and the management and protection of water resources. She is also director of the Book Cliff Conservation District, which is one of the three districts leading the Middle Colorado Ditch in Diversion Infrastructure Inventory. So, Wendy and Sarah, if you are ready, I will now hand it over to you. Wendy, I will now hand it over to you. All right, thank you. If anyone has difficulty hearing me, just put something in the chat box so that we can get that corrected. But as Phil said, beginning in the summer of 2018, the Middle Colorado Watershed Council, Book Cliff, Mount Sofers, and Southside Conservation Districts stepped up on behalf of the communities in the Middle Colorado River area to spearhead development of an integrated watershed management plan. Wendy, can you advance to the next slide? So the first thing that we did is we came up with a mission statement. It was to improve security for all water uses in the Middle Colorado River by understanding and protecting existing uses, meeting shortages, and promoting healthy riverine ecosystems and agriculture in the face of increased future demand and climate uncertainty. If only we had known in 2018 how true those last few words were going to become with, the, with what we've had this summer. 
Next slide. Why an integrated plan? The Colorado Water Plan calls for stream management plans for locally prioritized rivers. A stream management plan uses biological, hydrological, and geomorphological and other data to assess the flows for other physical conditions that are needed to support environmental and recreational values. But within the Colorado River Basin, and particularly with the Colorado Basin Roundtable, we have emphasized equalizing consideration of all water uses when evaluating needs and shortages. And so we came up with what we called an integrated water management plan, which considers consumptive use needs and risks, as well as the ecological and recreational considerations. Local input has been critical in defining what those water needs are, what the constraints and issues are, and opportunities for optimizing land and water management within the watershed. By taking an integrated approach, it allows the opportunity to educate each other on water needs from the different sectors, to discuss collective interests, and understand future risks. It, it has really been an interesting process because I think when we first started, agriculture really felt like there was a target on their back with the Colorado Compact po call possibly coming on that everyone was going to come to them for their water. And the recreational and more the environmental components felt like, well, no one was considering their interests. It's all about, for, you know, first in time, first in priority. And it really has brought these two entities or these two perspectives together, this integrated plan where the recreational and environmental have come to really realize that agriculture has a lot of open space and other really quality values and that water use is necessary to enhance that, to enhance wildlife, ecosystems. And so I think that has, the multi-benefit projects that we've been looking at have really brought us together. Next slide. So how do we coordinate? Well, the Book Cliff Southside and Mount Sofer's Conservation Districts um, took the lead on the consumptive use needs, risks, and analysis. We looked at agriculture, municipal, industrial, oil and gas is big within our area. And we started with an infrastructure inventory and assessment. And that's something that Wendy's going to go into detail here soon. The Middle Colorado Watershed Council took the lead on the environmental and recreational use needs and risks analysis. So we both obtained separate funding. Um, primary source of that funding was the Colorado Basin Roundtable and the Colorado Water Conservation Board. We also had private funding, which included individual ditch companies, um, the conservation districts, some water conservancy districts. And so it really was a grassroots effort to make sure that we had the funding that we needed. Both the conservation districts and the Middle Colorado Watershed Council uh, hired their own project managers and technical consultants. And we've utilized an umbrella advisory committee or stakeholder group to guide the planning and to work along with specific outreach and events to engage particular sectors. And now we're in the process of combining all those efforts, the information we've gotten out of the focus groups, taking it back to that advisory committee, having them screen it one more time, and then we're working on the actual drafting of the plan documents. Next slide. <clears throat> Um, I guess I'll start the here. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. No, I was just saying I'm handing it off. Oh, okay. Um, we're going to start here. Um, <clears throat> the Colorado Ag Water Network produced a short video for um, our ditch and inventory assessment. So we're just going to start uh, showing this. The Middle Colorado Watershed supports many uses, including agriculture, municipal, environment, and recreation. To support irrigated water management in the watersheds, the Mount Sopris, Book Cliff, and Southside Conservation Districts have partnered on a ditch inventory project. This multi-partner project documents conditions of irrigation ditches within the watershed. The district's work is an example of how an assessment of irrigation infrastructure can help identify and prioritize areas where multi-benefit improvement projects are both needed and feasible. I am the fourth generation, and I'm raising the fifth generation on Porter Ranch 
south of Newcastle, Colorado. We grow hay, grain, and cattle. I was born and raised in Rifle, Colorado, and my family's been here in this area since 1883. We have about 140 acres, and I produce hay. I don't believe many users of the ditch understand, other than from their head gate to their field, what the rest of the ditch entails and some of the problem spots. Having the ditch inventory would be the first step in addressing some of those issues. In order to understand the consumptive use portion of the integrated water management plan, we have to get a handle on how the water is used and who's using it. Doing the ditch inventory helps us quantify the amount of water that's being diverted for consumptive beneficial use, as well as we need to understand our rights. We're overseeing and managing the ditch inventory that's taking place, going out and helping landowners assess their ditch conditions and trying to find projects on the ground that we can help landowners, water users, improve their water efficiency and protect their water right. We're assessing the condition of the head gate. Can that water user get water into their head gate and efficiently move it down their ditch? Documenting culverts, all of the smaller head gates off of the ditch, the laterals, any points of failure that might exist on that ditch, if there is a, an area of erosion or if there is wetlands being created from that ditch, invasive species, if we can document those and try to get landowners to recognize what those issues are. Our Garfield Creek ditch that they inventoried, there was a spot in the mid-90s, the ditch seeped and slid, very time-consuming, lots and lots of money to fix that ditch. And maybe with some of these ditch inventories, they can see problems like that before they occur. So once the inventory has been done, the ditch has been walked, we've documented all the different points on the ditch. We have a GIS technician that then maps all of that, spots the irrigated acreage that the state has assessed that belongs to that ditch. But we're also providing all of the background information to those water users, all of their water right decrees, the different priority dates and uses decreed on that structure understanding how much water the ditches hold and what size a reservoir could be built on that ditch. I see that ditch inventory as a tool to use to hopefully build more reservoirs. Once you know what your ditch looks like, the condition, you know about your water right, you know how to protect it, then we're giving them information on grant opportunities. I just see it as a way to get a connection of ideas from the different producers of what they're doing, what's working, what's not working, and then make plans to implement changes. The ideal long-term thoughts are the efficiencies that we can achieve on the land with our irrigation can be modified or adjusted so that more water could be left in the streams appropriate times. Multi-use projects build partnerships between landowners and other water users. The major thing is you're going to find more funding opportunities. Hopefully, if we can work our way through the integrated water management plan, maybe we can get to a place that's more ideal than it is now. Okay, so I hope everyone enjoyed that video. Um, we were pretty proud of um, the product that came out of <clears throat> the Colorado Ag Water Alliance working with us on that. Um, and it just gives a good overview of what we're working on and what we're trying to achieve with these um, infrastructure inventories. Um, so the big thing is we're trying to empower ditch owners, water right owners, to understand what their water right is, um, how to protect it by doing these assessments. Um, as, you know, as it was shown in the video, <clears throat> we're providing all of the background information so that these water right owners know exactly what they have, what's on record with the state. Um, so we provide all of their water right decrees that are um, decreed for that structure. The state keeps diversion records in what is, uh, they call it the Colorado Decision Support System um, through the Division of Water Resources. So uh, it's a very powerful tool developed by the state. You can get in there and see all of the diversion records that are on record for your structure. And then we also do the structure evaluation. So uh, my company, Colorado River Engineering, is working with uh, the Mount Sopris Book Cliff and Southside Conservation District. Um, we, the conservation districts have technicians that will, they actually go out and physically walk the ditch, um, document what they see on the ditch. Uh, we're looking at the condition of the head gate. Um, is, it, 
in good condition and able to get water into the ditch and onto the lands um, that they're delivering the water to. Um, we also look at the measuring devices, uh, make sure that your measuring device is properly um, level and is reading accurately so that the Division of Water Resources can accurately record your diversion records through time. Um, we also provide anything we saw on the structure. Um, if, you know, if you've got sedimentation or debris building up in culverts, if we see a, you know, a seep along the ditch that's creating wetlands, that could be a potential point of failure at some point, um, invasive species, uh, obviously we want to encourage landowners to uh, take care of those invasive species and get them off the ditch. Even if they're not invasive, uh, getting some of that vegetation out of the ditch more efficiently moves that water down the ditch. That vegetation isn't taking that water before it reaches the field where you're trying to irrigate. Uh, the conservation technicians carry a GPS with them and a camera. They're documenting all the points on that ditch, the head gate, where's, where is the, the flume or the weir that's the measuring device, where are all the various culverts, if there are tunnels, um, pipe sections of ditch, all of that is documented, brought into a GIS mapping system, and then all of that is provided back to the landowner. Um, all of the, the photographs that are taken, um, uh, they're evaluated by the technicians as well as our company uh, to just take a look and see what we think, you know, points of failure, the, you know, the critical points on the ditch are. And then, so we package all of that together. Um, so the, the structure assessment, all of the water right decrees, the structure summary, which includes the water right information, the diversion records, and the irrigated acreage assessment done by the state. That's all packaged together along with information from the conservation districts and the NRCS regarding irrigation and conservation practices, as well as all of the available funding opportunities, the various entities that uh, provide grant opportunities or you know, low interest loans to help these producers get the projects done that we have identified. So this is just kind of a mishmash showing you kind of what we give back to the landowner. In the top left, you can see uh, where we've mapped the ditch and then highlighted the acreage that the state has tied to that structure. And that's one of the main um, discrepancies and in information that we found through this process. The state does an irrigated acreage assessment for each structure in the state, and it's done through uh, satellite data and just knowing where these structures are. It's, it's looked at by the water commissioners, but there's a lot of structures out there. So what we're seeing is that the lands that the state has tied to these structures are not always accurate, and in some cases they are vastly underrepresented. So this is one of the things that we've been trying to come up with a solution to improve the accuracy of these data. Um, it, we haven't really come up with a good solution, but I think if you know how to find this information or if you need someone to help you find this information and you can see that it's wrong, um, get back with the D Division of Water Resources and, and self-report what your acreage is to them. Because when the state runs these big consumptive use models and they're quantifying agricultural gaps, this is what they're relying on. They're relying on your structure, its diversion records, and the lands that it's irrigating. So if that's not accurate, then these big state models that they're making um, are not providing accurate information in terms of shortages. Um, on the bottom left here, you can see the, the way that the state um, provides graphics on the diversion records. You can see the diversions by month and year. Um, the, the color coding in each bar is the different month, and then the various uh, amounts that were diverted each year. And you can see how highly variable they are from year to year. And that's large, largely dependent on what the snowpack was that year and how much water came down the, the creek. Um, this is just an example of, you know, an original water right decree decreed to the Murray and Yule Ditch. Um, you know, you can see how old some of these decrees are back into the late 1800s. Um, just an example of what our uh, report looks like, identifying the potential treatments. Um, for the issues that we have identified, whether it's uh, erosion, phreatophytes, which is just a fancy word for uh, vegetation along the ditch, um, water that, or plants that are consuming that water before it makes it to the field, um, and the headgate condition, 
Um, a lot of times you'll see something about a measuring device in here needing to be leveled or needing to be replaced. Um, and then, you know, the photo is us delivering the inventory back to the water user and then also that information that's coming from the NRCS and the Conservation District on, um, you know, the different conservation practices and, and grant opportunities available to the water user. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Sarah to talk about some of the projects on the horizon. Thank you, Wendy. Before I move to the projects on the horizon, I have to say that these evaluations are really incredible. If you had to go out and hire an attorney and an engineer to do this for you, it would cost somewhere in the range of $5,000. And I have found that they're really helpful in mutual ditches or ditches that have multiple users, especially ones that have people moving in and out of them frequently because it's just one consolidated place where they can find all of the information that they need. The map is amazing, and then also having access to funding opportunities to resolve the issues that are identified. So I, I have strongly encouraged all of the ditches that I've been involved with to go through the inventory process and take advantage of that. So the inventory process is supposed to, and the integrated water management planning to help us identify projects that might be beneficial. And one of the things that we've looked at is diversion structure upgrades. There are multiple benefits on this, more precise measurement, ease of operation through automation. It provides for fish passage, minimize entrainment, which is basically the evaporation um, when you get those big sprays of water and to improve your water quality. The other thing that I believe that this really does is it's beneficial for water administration. If you have a good head gate and an accurate measuring device, then you can make sure that you're getting the water that you're entitled to instead of just having a guess by the water commissioner. Okay, next slide. Second one is ditch lining. Obviously, this will improve efficiency. It can create higher delivery yields, improves water quality. It reduces your annual maintenance requirements. But there are certain divisions, such as in the Arkansas Basin, that have some efficiency rules. We call that Rule 10. And so those must be considered when you're undertaking efficiency projects. We've also been studying the secondary impacts. So we have some really big irrigation ditches, and there's a lot of residents below that that operate on wells. And so we've also tried to take into consideration what impact does that have on their well production for their domestic use. Next slide. Riparian restoration. Um, this benefits obviously our noxious weed control, removing the tamarask and other species that's taking water that we don't that we don't want. It improves forage, enhances habitat for wildlife, improved ecosystem function. Um, I think that our farmers and ranchers do a lot of this along their streamways, um, and in this we have looked at some larger projects where we can get private and public people together to do larger areas. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide. Small scale storage, that was highlighted in the video. Um, storage is becoming really difficult. It's expensive. There's a lot of engineering that goes into it, permitting. Um, but I think that we have found that when we have small scale storage projects with multiple benefits, that they really are important. Uh, supplemental irrigation storage, it gives us greater environmental base flows. We can retime some of the water. We can pull that water in in the spring. We allow the sediment to settle out of it. And then we can release it later in the year when those streams are warm and the fish need some cooling flows. And also it provides for additional augmentation supply. One of the unexpected things we found was in 2020 when we had the Grizzly Creek fire and the Pine Creek fire on the western slope both kind of bookending our conservation district areas is that these small scale storage were used uh, for firefighting reserves for aerial suppression efforts. So if there was a pond out in the open, then the helicopters would just drop in and take the water that they needed in order to fight those fires. Next slide. Okay, reach scale pilot projects, public and private lands. This is what I was talking about with the opportunity to pair public and private partnerships to focal areas um, to create these strategic alliances so that you can complete larger projects that have multiple components and larger regional impacts. Um, 
The USDA has done this, uh, both through the Forest Service and the um, Natural Resource Conservation Services. Um, Trout Unlimited is very good at, at trying to put together these types of things where you can do riparian and habitat restoration. Uh, maybe a ditch company needs a diversion structure upgrade, and so you can get some additional funds to come in if you include the fish passage on that. Um, gravel pit reclamation, recreational access to the streams with some of your riparian habitat restoration and noxious weed removal. Um, conservation easements or other financial incentives. So this is really what we've been trying to do is that we're identifying areas within our management planning where we have these opportunities where we can pull together different groups with different funding sources and different resources, natural resources, in order to create a much better habitat, water supply, et cetera. Okay, Wendy. Hey, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about how we've used some of the state planning models that I mentioned earlier. It used to be called the State Water Supply Initiative, SWAZI, um, and this year they've kind of rebranded it as a technical update to the Colorado Water Plan. Um, but it's the same models, a slightly different approach than the old SWAZI models were. Um, but what we wanted to do were, was take those state models and take a, a, you know, a smaller scale look for our area of interest, uh, which is roughly uh, dot zero to Debec. Um, we don't do so much in Glenwood Canyon, but most of our acreage, you know, we see between Glenwood and Debec. Um, so we've taken these models and downscaled uh, state mod is the, the model that they use um, along with state CU, which is state consumptive use model. Um, and we've looked at it by tributary. So a lot of times when the state gives reports, they're giving them as, you know, results for the Colorado Basin. Well, we wanted to see what those results look like for our area um, and specifically by tributary. So the way they do that is um, for larger ditches where they've got good diversion records and good acreage assessment, well, good um, in terms of they have an acreage assessment for it. For it um, they term, them, term those explicit structures, and they are modeling them within um, these larger state models, um, that structure to its acreage. So what we've done is taken those explicit structures and then use that to scale it up to the full irrigated area within each tributary basin. Um, and on the right here, you can see by drainage, um, and so it gives the water district, so we encompass water districts 39, 70, and 45. 39 is north of the Colorado River, 45 is south of the Colorado River, and then 70 is really the, the Roan Creek drainages. Um, so you can see the area within those drainages that is represented by what is termed these explicit structures. And most of the drainages have a good representation. You can see there's a couple, uh, Clear Creek in uh, Water District 70 is only 4% represented by their explicit structures. So um, a little bit lacking there, um, but for the most part, and you can see Mam Creek in District 45, only 19% of that acreage is represented by explicit structures. Um, but we've taken this and scaled up these explicit structures to represent the full tributary area. And we've developed the agricultural shortages by tributary using uh, the modeled supplies and demands coming out of uh, these state models. Uh, so the technical update includes these uh, five planning scenarios, um, and in addition, there's a baseline scenario. So where are we now? <clears throat> uh, and then scenario A is business as usual, and you can kind of see with these graphics what's changing um, from scenario to scenario. So business as usual, you can see water supply kind of average where we've got it, um, the climate status, the social values, the agricultural needs, and then not so much pertinent to this conversation, but the municipal and industrial needs are there on the bottom. And for our analysis, it's really the, the water supply and the climate status that are impacting the, the changes from scenario to scenario. And then the social values, that you know, willingness for people to you know, use emerging technologies, that kind of stuff is what those social values are representing. So you can see as you go through this, you kind of get to a worst case scenario with that hot growth where you've got a reduced water supply, you've got a hot climate status, um, social values are kind of low. Um, 
So business as usual and hot growth kind of bookend what we're seeing through these planning scenarios. But we also have the weak economy, the cooperative growth, and the adaptive innovation planning scenarios to look at. Uh, so this is the results. I, you know, I didn't want to bore you with too much data, but just want to kind of provide the results by water district. So this is water district 39. Again, that's north of the Colorado River from uh, pretty much Glenwood to uh, Debec, excluding the Roan Creek drainage. And you can see the different tributaries, Elk Creek, Canyon Creek, Rifle Creek, and Parachute Creek that we've got, that we were able to represent with the, these data outputs. And you can see generally north of the river, the water supplies are a little bit more reliable. Um, generally, total shortage is less than 10%, except on Rifle Creek when you start getting into those later scenarios, the hotter, um, lower water supply scenarios, you start coming up above 10% shortages in those um, later planning scenarios, uh, C, D, and E. But generally, fairly small shortages experienced in Water District 39. Uh, you go to the south side of the river where they don't benefit from the silt project, uh, water in storage like District 39 does. And these ditches um, and drainages are really dictated by the, you know, the physical supply given by snowpack year to year. And what we see are much larger shortages in these drainages. You can see Garfield Creek upwards of 70% short um, on average through these different planning scenarios. And it gets worse, almost up to 80% on Garfield Creek by the time you get into that hot growth scenario. Um, so these two graphics are very telling for our um, area that you know, when you're under a water storage project, you've got more flexibility and you have smaller agricultural shortages than when you pretty much get the water as it comes down. You know, on the, in District 45, those producers will sometimes only get water you know, for a couple days or a couple weeks. So you've got to use it before it all runs off, um, which doesn't make for very efficient diversions or um, efficient applications to the land. Um, yeah, so Garfield Creek obviously experiencing the highest shortages but most of these experiencing greater than 30% shortage. And then obviously the Colorado River, is we included that in, in this district and very small shortages um, on the Colorado River, as one would expect. And then Water District 70, uh, again, not quite as bad, a uh, little bit more reliable water supply and not as much uh, irrigated acreage. Um, but you can see Roan Creek probably experiencing the highest in the 10 to 20% range and then Clear Creek and Car Creek, um, less than 10% shortages through most of the planning scenarios. So can storage help? I think the, the previous graphics kind of illustrated how Water District 39 benefits from Rifle Gap and Harvey Gap Reservoirs, the silt project being operated through the Siltwater Conservancy District and the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, so we have large shortages on the Divide Creek system and one of our local water conservancy districts, West Divide Water Conservancy District, they hold a conditional water right for what is called Kendig Reservoir in the amount of about 16,500 acre feet. It would be sited in the headwaters of West Divide Creek. So we use this technical update data for the Divide Creek drainage to determine how we could store water um, and how that might affect the shortages that we saw in the Divide Creek drainage. Um, through the planning scenarios. Um, and the basic issue is that the water supply is not aligned with the water demands. And you can see that here on the right. Um, we're showing the total supply on the blue line, um, which kind of peaks in June. And then it peaks as our, rant, as our demands are just uh, peaking and they stay pretty high. So the area between these two lines is essentially what the gap is um, on Divide Creek. And then these are the results. So uh, made a, a, a spreadsheet model to see um, what we could store in Kendig Reservoir and then how that water could be released to later meet uh, demands um, in that basin. The main rule of this was because Kendig is such a junior water right, all of the demands uh, downstream had to be met before Kendig could store water um, if there was excess water available. Um, and then that water put into storage is then released later to meet demands later in the season where there was not a, a natural supply. So you can see here just through the different plant, planting scenarios the way the shortage um, dropped, um, having that storage above. Obviously, you know, 
West Divide Creek doesn't have a, it, it's highly variable to year to year. It's highly dependent on how much snow you get each year. So we don't see the reduction in shortages like we saw north of the river, but it does help um, through these planning scenarios to have that storage to retime the runoff and more align the water supply with the water demands from agriculture. And then just in summary, uh, so tributary water users pretty much experience shortages every year. You know, it's a physical shortage as well as an administrative shortage. Once that senior local tributary call comes on, most other water users are out of priority and can't divert. And that comes on usually way before a cameo call will come on on most of these tributaries. Storage projects are a potential solution to help reduce these agricultural shortages that I showed. Um, but like Sarah mentioned, permitting, construction costs are often limiting factors, especially for a fairly large storage project. Um, so the ditch inventory is providing <coughs> valuable information regarding these agricultural water rights. And multi-benefit multi projects, as we discussed, likely have the best chance of success. If you can uh, provide supplemental irrigation water while providing a conservation pool for a fishery in that reservoir, if you can make late season releases to boost in-stream flows when you know, natural flows have already come down, um, you have a better chance of getting that project up and off the ground than if you were solely building a, a reservoir for um, irrigation. Um, also recreational benefits, if you, can have, uh, if you can let the public on to that reservoir and let, you know, get those flat, boating, uh, flat water boating opportunities to the public. Uh, water users need to ensure that their diversion records and their acreage assessments on record with the state are accurate. Um, we've been trying to help with this, but ultimately uh, those water users need to, to step up and get that information into the, the Division of Water Resources. So th when we use these models, we know that we're using good data. Um, and if that means self-reporting that to the Division of Water Resources, I would encourage that. Um, and then the Integrated Watershed Management Plan has been a collaborative process. as Sarah spoke about um, between the consumptive, the environmental, and the recreational water users in the Middle Colorado watershed. Um, so working together can solve water issues and increase our chances of success uh, to fix um, our water issues, as well as providing additional funding opportunities to water users in the basin. And with that, I think we'll take any questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Wendy and Sarah. That was, that was awesome. Uh, a lot to absorb. We do have a couple questions. Um, can you provide the name of the company that pr uh, developed the GIS database and the user interface for the ditch inventory? Uh, you know, the GIS is just done in, in house here at our, at our company. We have a GIS technician that, um, you know, manages all that data and provides the, you know, develops the mapping. Um, so that's, that's all it is. Okay. And the question about funding, where did the funding come from? I know you touched on that briefly, but if you could just expand on that, uh, where are all the different sources of funding? And I'll just tag team onto that question because I know it's partially related is um, there was sensitivity, I know, relative to how the data would be used and who would be able to access the data. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Sarah, do you want to take that one? Sure, I can, I can take that. Um, I can tell you it takes a lot of volunteer hours. Um, both, both only have one project manager and a technician employed that are paid out of the grant funds or the private funds that have been donated for this process. So the rest of it is basically people volunteering to help conduct those focus groups to, you know, getting out and doing some educational seminars. Um, but the roundtable CWCB or the Colorado Water Conservation Board were instrumental in, in funding the Integrated Watershed Management Plan. Conservation districts each put up $20,000 and then we had obviously our private funds. With the ditch inventory, there was a lot of concern. Um, the producers were concerned that a neighbor might try to get a hold of the information or someone that had interests adverse to their own would try to get a hold of that information. And most of this is public information other than the actual map, mapping of the ditch and identification of weaknesses within that structure. The decrees are online, the diversion records are online, everything else is available if you know where to go and get it. Um, 
But as the process went through, we've been very careful um, with how that information is managed. It's not posted online anywhere, the complete reports. It's only provided, so we, we complete the report, we sit down with that producer or that ditch company, we present the report to them, we answer any questions regarding it, and, and that's the end of the process. And we haven't had any adverse impacts from that. We haven't had any requests. Um, we work with USDA and the conservation districts use the same confidentiality procedures that they have that prevent people from just coming in and asking for landowner data. So that has worked well. And I think that we, are, we did our first inventory in October of 2018 and 2019, we did the most of them. And it really, it really picked up speed as people became more confident in the process and they began to see the product that they were receiving. Okay. And we had another question. Uh, how do ATM, ag water leases, you know, alternative me uh, transfer mechanisms, whatever you, you want to call them, how do they fit into all this? We have not had a lot of agricultural or ATMs over on the Western Slope, um, at least within our middle Colorado watershed area. Uh, we benefit on the main stem from a lot of storage, which has helped most of those municipalities. Um, but it does provide them the data that they would need to participate in that. If they wanted to go to the Colorado Water Trust in order to do a three out of 10 lease in order to um, enhance in-stream flows, or if they wanted to do some other sort of arrangement with a municipal entity. They would now have accurate diversion records. They would have accurate mapping of the area so that that consumptive use could be calculated. Um, it also has helped to educate a lot of producers as to these temporary leases and ATM opportunities. I think that there's a lot of misconception that that will still hurt your water right in the end. And there's been a lot of statutory changes that protect, protect that water right owner so that when that water is being leased for an environmental purpose, if you follow the statute, it doesn't hurt your overall consumptive use quantification in the end. And it has given us an opportunity to help educate producers as to these legal changes. Yeah, you mentioned that the value of that would be around $5,000. And that's, I guess, per producer in terms of the analysis that's done on uh, the ditch section and the head gates, the culverts, other things that appurtenances that might carry water that might affect them as well as the entire legal review, if you will, or uh, the compilation of documents and records related to all of their past uh, diversions as well as the, the acreage uh, associated with their decrees and uh, things like that. So um, I'm just wondering, uh, as things have really gotten rolling, you said in 2019, uh, adding that to 2018, how many ditch groups and producers have participated? Uh, we've done about 50 structures. Okay. And, and would that just be among uh, quite a number of ditch groups or? Yep, um, some of them are, you know, just a couple water users on a ditch and then some of them have, you know, lots of ditch users. So we've done the Lower Cactus Valley Ditch, which which has I don't know, probably 50 or more users on it. Um, as, and then just small private um, one water user ditches. So we've, we've run the gamut on these for sure. Mm -hmm. As you have compiled this information and presented it to producers and ditch groups, what sorts of projects have been the most predominant in terms of, of interest and opportunities? You know, I think there's been a few that have come into the conservation districts to get some funding. Um, one was to do a, you know, a ditch lining or a ditch piping project where they had a potential um, issue that was going to, you know, be a failure fairly soon. We've had one producer who didn't have a head gate at all, just some, you know, tarps in the creek and some rocks and, you know, encouraged him that he should really have a, a functional head gate. Um, a, a, a lot of the common things we see are, uh, you know, sedimentation issues, um, especially on the south side of the river. Um, so, and then really driving home the routine ma operation and maintenance of your structure, um, getting big trees off the ditch banks before the roots on the ditch bank create a failure, or getting um, invasive species or willows off the ditch so they're not consuming that water prior to it making to the making it to the ditch. Um, 
routine cleaning out of culverts so that doesn't create a blockage and a backup and, and a potential failure. So, um, Sarah, are you aware of any other projects that came into the districts? No, I think that those are the primary ones. I think the biggest impact it's had is the maintenance element that we talked about. People don't tend to think of ditches as having a lifetime or a lifespan. And we see a lot of this concrete that's, you know, 100 years old or some of these pipes that have been in there forever. And it really makes people realize that if I will maintain it, then I will get more water and I will therefore have more production. The only other class of improvements, but these are on a longer time frame because they're more expensive, would be the fish passage or fish blocking type structures. And those are important on the tributaries where we have cut off some of our fish passages. And now we are looking at those with Trout Unlimited with some other groups to see if we can integrate those into new headgate improvements, whether we're retrofitting an existing headgate or whether an old headgate needs to come out. And usually these are big diversion dams, low head dams across a, a small tributary. Um, and so then the water, it just dries up that section of the water. And Colorado Water Law tells you that you have to sweep the stream in order to place a call. And so we have to find a way that we can marry these two concepts together and still have people in good legal standing. Okay. I think we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap it up. If you and I had talked, uh, Wendy, before about the basin implementation plans and the 2020 is the year of the basin implementation plan update throughout the state. All the basin roundtables are updating their plans. This seems like uh, it's really worked out well in the timing of your project because you have a lot of information to provide. I just wondered if you could kind of share with us how that information, all of those projects that have been identified and the needs around those improvements that individual you know, structures and things are, are looking to uh, implement, how that's being kind of pushed uh, into the basin implementation plan update. Yeah, so the timing wasn't perfect, um, but it, it, it is aligned where we can get the projects that we've identified through um, the integrated watershed management plan um, and get that up and into the basin implementation plan. So uh, when the, the deadline for the implementation, basin implementation plan projects to be given back to um, their consultant was, I think it was in July sometime. So at that point we had draft um, projects coming out of the various focus groups um, within the Middle Colorado Integrated Watershed Management Plan. So in addition to the consumptive use group, there is a recreation group, a water quality group, an aquatics group, and a riparian health group. Um, so each of these focus groups have identified projects that they want included in the plan. And at, when the basin implementation plan wanted these projects, we essentially gave them all of our draft recommendations that we had at that point. So they have already been, even though they weren't vetted by our advisory committee, well, we're hoping that we have time to, to edit that um, as changes are made to our plan and also filter that back up to the basin implementation plan. So all everything that our focus groups identified have been included in the projects, the identified projects and processes, the IPMPs for the basin implementation plan. Great. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, really uh, special thanks to our speakers, Wendy Ryan and Sarah Dunn. You covered a lot of ground. It was really interesting. Thank you for enlightening us on this whole ditch and diverse structure inventory process, as well as just how the overall consumptive use evaluation in the middle of Colorado watershed has gone, um, how you have kind of come together on the consumptive use and non-consumptive use side, and now bringing that information together and, and integrating it. You provided some really useful information for producers around the state that have ditch rights, um, as well as I think any watershed groups that are looking to perform a consumptive use inventory like, like you've been embarked uh, in doing. So uh, the, just one more reminder, we are recording this webinar and it will be posted on agwaternetwork.org next week along with the highlights. And with that, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you.